Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for a State of the Heart webinar. Tonight, Dr. Reeve will speak on peripheral arter artery disease. Dr. Reeve is a native from Carroll County and graduated from Carrollton High School. He attended the University of Georgia to study his undergrad and then continued his education at Mercer University for medical school. Dr. Reeve completed his general surgery residency at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. While there, he also completed a master's degree. Dr. Reeve completed his vascular surgery fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta prior to joining Tanner Vascular Surgery. Dr. Reeve, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Caitlin. <clears throat> Thank you all for taking the time to come uh, join this um, uh, program that we have this evening. I think this is will be the first uh, and maybe a few that are set up for Kind of vascular disease and cardiac disease and so the we'll get started with this and this is primarily focused on peripheral arterial disease and so i'll kind of go through and give a little bit of a overview and uh, signs and symptoms things to look out for and diagnostic measures treatment options ways to uh, for prevention things and uh, hopefully we'll uh, leave you with a little bit of information and and uh, hopefully it won't be too long and dragged out Let's see. So um, again, kind of going over what we've, uh, what the plan is uh, for tonight. Again, just try to give a little bit of an overview, go over some of the risk factors, symptoms to kind of look out for, how we diagnose peripheral vascular disease, some of the treatment and, and ways we can do to try to avoid uh, significant peripheral vascular disease. So what is peripheral arterial disease? So I think primarily the first and foremost is this is kind of vascular disease outside of the heart. I think everybody, I get, you know, technically we always, everyone thinks artery disease and everyone's focus is just the heart, but, um, and that's, uh, I'm sure some of those talks will be coming uh, soon, but this is going to be kind of talking outside of the heart um, and, the, and the vessels outside of the heart, but very similar patients, very similar risk factors. Um, and, uh, and so essentially it's, it's a narrowing or blockage of the arteries. So uh, over time, there's a buildup of plaque, which was causes narrowing and can eventually progress to the point that it can cause uh, the arteries to become blocked and impede the blood flow to whether it's uh, primarily we're talking about the lower extremities and the legs, but it can also happen in the arms and uh, going up to the brain as well. Um, and just as a, a very general overview, the arteries are, they are carrying the blood from the heart um, and then going out and then the veins, which are kind of a part of the same piping system, but very different, manage very different, different risk factors, things kind of essentially a, an entirely separate entity really. And that's bringing the blood that essentially from your legs back to the heart. So we'll be talking about the arteries that's going from the heart out to the rest of the body. Like I said, it's so commonly you'll hear it called atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic disease. And again, those are all interchangeable for essentially, you know, build up a plaque within the arteries. And this is just a schematic picture of uh, ideally these, the normal blood flow that you see through the, the multiple layered arterial wall in the vessel. And over time, uh, you start to get this, um, the plaque that starts to build up within the wall. And as you can see, it can cause, you know, one problem would be a, a piece of this that breaks off and goes down, down to the leg or the foot or the toe but probably more commonly you see that over time it continues to build and build and build to the point where it impedes the flow down here. And just kind of think of it like the, like a Creek or a river where if it gets dammed up and things, the, the flow downstream is just a lot less and a lot lower. So why do we care about peripheral arterial disease? And one is just a major uh, global health pop, uh, problem. The, uh, we know that the, in general, just the, the population is, is aging. The uh, people are growing older and with it is coming associated problems. And, and also the prevalence of diabetes, the prevalence of smoking, although you know, that's probably been being curved a little bit, but this is worldwide. There's still a lot of people that uh, still smoking is very common throughout other parts of the world, even though maybe not as much, or at least they're controlling it back a little bit more here in the United States. Uh, the prevalence of uh, high blood pressure or hypertension, as well as high cholesterol. All of those are, are increasing in addition to the aging population. That's why, um, that's why there's such a good focus on, on peripheral arterial disease. 
It's estimated that about 200 million people worldwide are affected. This number may even be, high, be higher for those people that maybe have kind of early or what we call preclinical disease. That's really not maybe not definitively diagnosed yet. But and, and it's important to understand that this is not just a, an issue with underdeveloped countries. This is a very real world problem in, in developed countries. And so uh, it is uh, it, it is all around us and, and here as well. And this is just a, a little bit of a diagram to kind of show the prevalence. And this just looks at by gender and age. And as you can see, um, as, as people get older, and this is age here down on the bottom, that uh, the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease really jumps up between 70 and, and those over 80 years old. And, and you can see early on, it seems to be women a little bit younger seem to be more affected. And as as uh, people get older, it seems to be uh, more commonly uh, prevalent noted in, within men. So what are risk factors uh, for peripheral arterial disease? As you saw from the last uh, graph there image, uh, it's really much more common in those older than 80. And, and uh, the, the data shows probably about a one in four patients uh, over the 80 uh, have some form of peripheral arterial disease. And it really is a very rare in, in, in younger patients. And usually if, if people are having some sort of symptoms that are younger than 40, then it's probably best that we, we look elsewhere, try to find uh, maybe other causes of, of signs or symptoms that may be, that we think may be related, uh, but might be something else. Race, there's some studies that have uh, shown a higher incidence uh, and even worse outcomes in African-Americans, but they also went back and they controlled for diabetes and high blood pressure and, and weight, uh, and those uh, really did not explain it. So there's something else uh, besides those other comorbid conditions that uh, is potentially causing a higher incidence and even worse outcomes in African-Americans. Here's probably the two biggest uh, smoking and diabetes. There's probably a two to fourfold odds of developing peripheral arterial disease in those that smoke. And there has been some data that even secondhand smoke does carry some risk, although much significantly lower. But smoking is, is really, <clears throat> it is very damaging to the blood vessels and, uh, and, and blood vessels in the peripheral, but also the blood vessels into the, the heart, which I'm sure will get discussed later, but very, but very similar effects and, and really detrimental effects. Diabetes is in very similar in the same boat as smoking. And when you combine these two, this is probably the highest risk of those for developing peripheral arterial disease and really worse outcomes, not just peripheral arterial disease, but the, the long-term uh, effects of peripheral arterial disease, which can lead to ultimately to amputation and even death from some sort of cardiovascular issue. High blood pressure is another risk factor. Uh, not does not contribute as much as smoking and diabetes, but certainly uh, it does increase that risk of developing peripheral vascular disease. Others, including high cholesterol, obesity, uh, but we kind of seem to lump this in, in the metabolic syndrome, which is just this term used for a combination of obesity, high blood pressure, uh, elevated triglycerides, and diabetes. And there's certainly some component of genetics. I think there's a, uh, you know, oftentimes you see patients who's, you know, so well, and I've got a family history of heart disease or vascular disease. And certainly there's some component that does contribute to that. And sometimes we don't always know ex exactly what the link, link is, but we certainly know that there is something there. So this just kind of breaks down. Um, kind of the progress, what I would call the progression of peripheral arterial disease, and and the the most basic and asymptomatic patient that has has no issues that maybe have a little bit of underlying plaque, but maybe they don't know it, or it's not to the point that it's uh, has developed any sort of symptoms that uh, is affecting their quality of life. The next kind of, and this is, I, I would probably tell you that this is probably not not quite as simple as this kind of step form, but the, the kind of the next level of peripheral vascular disease is what we call claudication. And essentially that's just pain when walking and patients often describe that, you know, they say, Hey, I, I'm able to walk, but I, I can walk a hundred feet or, you know, a couple blocks. And uh, every time I have to stop and, 
because my calf start to cramp or my hip or my buttock starts to cramp. And then if I stop and rest, it gets better. And then I'm able to continue to walk on and, and it happens again. And so we call that claudication. And, and a lot of times, again, there's some other causes of this, such as people can have back issues and nerve impingement that can, uh, can cause similar symptoms as, as this with vascular disease. But that's a, one of the very common symptoms that patients will often uh, endorse. When we really start to see severe peripheral vascular disease, patients start to get pain at rest and, and, and wounds. And this is where we really kind of consider that this is a critical point where really intervention, some sort of intervention needs to be done. And this pain at rest is usually... Um, when you're not stressing the muscles as much and requiring all that extra blood flow, uh, cause say, you know, you spend most of the day sitting or, um, you know, much more sedentary then then you may not get to the point where you experience that sort of pain with walking. So, and this is, this is really the majority of the patients. However, it doesn't mean that just because it's asymptomatic, there's not a risk. We, we do know and certain studies have shown that there's a, a high cardiovascular risk and even mortality with people that just have underlying peripheral vascular disease and uh, about 2.7 increased risk of all cause of death. And there's even a higher risk of coronary artery disease related death. And I think this just goes back to, to, to highlight the, um, the, the connection between kind of peripheral vascular disease and, and, coronary disease or heart disease. And I think that, you know, there's a lot, we, the cardiologist and I share a lot of the same patients because as I tell patients that the plaque that develops in their legs or, or vice versa in the heart, it, it, it doesn't just develop there really, it's a systemic process. And so it happens, uh, it's going to affect a lot of the blood vessels throughout most of the body. And, you know, the heart is one area that we oftentimes require some sort of intervention as well as the legs. So the next, what we talked about is the pain with ambulation. And again, this is where uh, this, that pain is brought on by some sort of exertion or exercise. And, and people often describe some cramping, usually in the calves or in the hip or the buttock area. Um, and then this is usually uh, relieved with rest. And usually this takes, you know, it takes a little bit of walking, depending on how severe it is before they experience the symptoms, but it should always be relieved by rest and not not normally when someone is, is sitting in front of their TV resting that they start to get this type of pain. Um, <clears throat> and even with the claudication, as I mentioned, with the asymptomatic disease, over five years, about 20% of patients with claudication can experience some sort of major cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack or stroke. And the mortality at five years, even with kind of mild, what we would consider claudication is 10 to 15%. So it shows you that, that it's a systemic process that even though the, you've got some, you know, maybe mild to moderate symptoms, there's probably other vascular disease elsewhere, whether it's the heart or in the arteries that go up to the neck that uh, place patients at risk for some sort of other issue down the road. And uh, fortunately, the risk of an amputation in patients that just have claudication is very low and less than 1% yearly. So this is as we progress to the more critical peripheral vascular disease, where again, patients get pain at rest or, or develop wounds. And sometimes you get some, what we call kind of rubrous changes or, or redness of the, the toes and the feet. Uh, again, it sometimes gets improved by by hanging the, uh, the foot over the side of the bed or the chair to kind of help gravity uh, facilitate uh, pulling some of that blood down to, to improve flow. Sometimes we'll see patients that have a uh, little hair on their lower part of their legs and their toes, or people get small wounds on the toes or toenails that become difficult to heal. Sometimes this is a sign that maybe there's some underlying peripheral vascular disease. 
<clears throat> we usually call this critical limb threatening ischemia. Ischemia is spelled wrong here, but um, essentially this is again pain at rest and wounds is, is is to the point that hey something needs to be done. And again, not only is there a risk for some sort of limb issue or limb complication such as an amputation, but it increases the risk of heart attack, stroke, uh, excuse me, and even death. And as I mentioned, the, the one-year mortality in patients that have pain at rest or wounds secondary to severe peripheral vascular disease, uh, that mortality at a year is about 22%. And you're looking at also the risk without any intervention, the risk of an amputation is about one in four. So really, again, this is one of the reasons why that we are aggressive uh, as far as workup management and, and treatment of these people with really progressed um, vascular disease. Some of the predictors of amputation and death in this specific uh, patient population, those that are older, greater than 75, and those with other significant medical comorbidities, such as uh, kidney problems, uh, coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, dementia, uh, elevated weight, or even very low weight, and just generalized frailty. So how do we diagnose peripheral arterial disease? So one of the ways is, um, you know, what we call kind of non-invasive in imaging. Um, and this is kind of what I would consider more the, the test than not, not a procedural based thing. And one of the easy things that we can do in the office or a lot of primary care um, offices are able to do this is what we call an ankle brachial index. And essentially it's just comparing the, the blood pressure in the arms uh, to the blood pressure into the feet. And this is a nice, easy screening uh, it gives us a very objective measure. So it usually a, a, um, an ABI of less than 0.9 usually indicates there's some component of vascular disease. And uh, usually 0.9 to 1.3 or so is kind of what we consider normal. Sometimes uh, if you've ever had one of these done, sometimes you may have an elevated uh, ABI where it's 1.4, 1.5. And usually that it's indicative that there's probably some calcification in the walls of the blood vessel. So there's maybe some, the, some plaque that has developed. The next thing kind of as we move along in the workup and imaging is, is ultrasound. And the good thing about ultrasound is uh, it's relatively uh, easy to do. These can be done in the office. We have a an ultrasound tech or two ultrasound techs here in our office that all they do is look at blood vessels. So we're able to, to get a lot of images um, through this. You don't need any contrast or dye. Uh, um, and so that's one of the advantages. Uh, you know, usually we can get people in quick to get these done. Uh, you know, the other side of it is it's certainly operator dependent. So, uh, you know, fortunately, we're, we're, we are very fortunate to have two great vascular techs that uh, are able to do a lot of our studies here in the office. The next is CT imaging. It's not, not our kind of first go-to, but uh, I think this is better as we start deciding about potentially is there something that needs to be done uh, and helps us with potential planning if there's some sort of procedure. Uh, it does help a little bit with evaluating the blood vessels um, kind of above the groin because those are a little bit harder to see with the ultrasound. So if we suspect there's disease kind of in the abdominal portion in the blood vessels there, this is usually best with a CT scan. And, and unfortunately, it does require contrast administration, and, and it is obviously a little bit more expensive. This has to be done over at the hospital or at some sort of other imaging center. Uh, the invasive imaging. So I consider this, this is actually having a procedure done. And uh, this is something that we, um, we usually will start off with some sort of an ultrasound or an ABI in the office. And if we're to the point that, hey, we think that, uh, you know, there's something that needs to be done, then we consider taking people to do what we call an arteriogram. And essentially, we're putting an IV into the directly into the artery. And we take pictures, so it has the advantages of not just being diagnostic, but potentially therapeutic. While we're there, uh, you know, there are times that we're able to treat this with potentially using a balloon or a stent or, or some other modality to uh, to address and, and try to improve the blood flow. And, and again, it's a, um, you know, compared to big open surgery, it's uh, a little bit uh, less invasive. So some of the risks are a little bit lower, but uh, certainly not without some risk with having to access the artery. And again, you also have to get some contrast dyes. We have to be careful of people with allergies or some sort of a, um, a kidney disease, which may affect it. 
Um, so kind of transitioning over to the treatment. So uh, kind of first kind of the non-surgical therapy. And, you know, I think first and foremost, uh, to highlight the uh, risk factor modification. And again, in those that smoke, the the biggest thing is trying to cut back on smoking or, or, to, or to quit altogether. And they're certainly shown a benefit of those that, that do cut back and can uh, quit. Then, you know, there's certainly a good chance that they will potentially slow the progression of some of their disease. Uh, and then just managing other medical comorbidities, high blood pressure, high cholesterol uh, and diabetes, and not just controlling them, but making sure that they're uh, well controlled and, and the diabetes is well controlled and, Again, um, uh, that is extremely important. Um, uh, other non-surgical kind of medical therapy. So usually the first line treatment for those with claudication. And again, this is the pain with walking. We actually recommend people, you know, we initially start by medical therapy and essentially medications, which I'll go over here in a second, but, but also uh, actually walking. So there, there's been many, many studies that have shown the benefit of walking in those patients with claudication. And usually we recommend you know, at least 30 minutes a day, up to three times a week or so. And, and there's been some, there's some very good data that shows actually people will get to the point where they're able to walk further. Um, and a lot of times, you know, their, their quality of life is improved and they're able to do the things they do. And this will potentially avoid any sort of uh, surgical intervention or things. And uh, again, the goal of this is to walk to the point that it actually hurts and kind of gets that cramp, stop, rest, and then continue to walk again. And again, you know, the recommendations are at least maybe 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week. Um, and this just talking about at the bottom here about the, uh, again, and overall improvement in, in walking distance and things. And again, not just the other advantages of, of potentially improving other medical comorbidities, including cholesterol and blood pressure. So transitioning over to kind of medical therapy, what medication? So uh, for claudication, um, kind of the two, uh, the two FDA approved uh, pentoxyphylene and celastazole, which uh, or um, two medications and those people that, uh, you know, sometimes maybe it's not the first line therapy, but sometimes things that we will try to do to, to see if we can get some improvement without sort of any sort of surgical intervention. And, and Pletol works by kind of uh, decreasing the platelets, which are kind of the, uh, one of the factors that we have in our blood that causes, um, that helps to develop clot to try to kind of prevent those from from aggregating together and, uh, and also tries to kind of relax some of the muscle within the uh, blood vessel. And there's uh, good data that shows that uh, this has improved walking distance in patients with claudication. And probably one of the most common side effects is some GI issues with this. So there's something we have to be careful with. And uh, those with a history of congestive heart failure, we usually try to avoid. So when do we side between, you know, medical therapy versus surgical treatment? And it really is kind of go down, goes to, to based off the patients and the symptoms and uh, the presentation. Um, and, you know, just because someone has peripheral vascular disease doesn't always mean that they need some sort of surgical intervention. And again, with those with claudication, with the pain with walking, we really stress the, the non-operative therapy first. Uh, and again, this is kind of risk factor modification, the walking that we talked about, you know, sometimes trying, making sure they're on optical, optical medical therapy, uh, usually an aspirin and some cholesterol medicine. And then sometimes we try some of the other medications, such as the, the celastazole and things that, to see if that will help and improve some of their symptoms. Again, as I've mentioned before, once we progress to that point where patients get pain and rest and, and wounds or non-healing wounds, we're much more aggressive, as you saw, the, the significant risk of amputation and even mortality without intervention. And so those are the ones that we, we really recommend some sort of an invasive intervention. So what can we do as far as the surgical options? There's kind of the two... Uh, the two sides and uh, what we call the endovascular and open surgery and open surgery is kind of what I would say is kind of the old fashioned uh, surgery, the incision, things like that. Usually oftentimes this requires patients coming in the hospital for at least a day or so and have an incision usually have to be put under general anesthesia. Um, we have gotten to where we've become um, 
uh, we're quite commonly treating a lot of vascular disease now using endovascular, which is what, what I would describe as using the, the wires and the catheters, kind of like patients that get heart stents. We do very similar work where we work on the arteries and the legs and elsewhere in the body where we're able to, to, uh, to avoid a big incision and usually go through the groin with just a very small little skin incision. And again, oftentimes you know, don't require a general anesthesia, just some sedation. And a lot of times we're able to get people home uh, the same day. Um, for claudication, again, we usually, um, if patients have progressed to the point where we're talking about intervention, uh, usually we'll try an endovascular intervention first. And I think the, the success of this all depends on the, the anatomy, what sort of, a, if it's a small little narrowing or even a small blockage, a lot of times these can be treated with a balloon or a stem. But when we start talking about long segment blockages, those are a lot harder to treat with a balloon or stent, and sometimes those are uh, those are um, where we, we have to consider more uh, invasive open surgical interventions. Regarding critical limb ischemia, this is the rest pain in the wounds. Again, uh, some sort of intervention is recommended over just medical therapy alone. Um, there are good options between endovascular and open. It depends on sometimes the patient's physiologic status. You know, can they tolerate a big surgery or were they better off doing, try to do the more less invasive option? Um, and, uh, and so those are uh, things that we kind of consider uh, in treating these people. So just in, kind of lastly, going through some uh, prevention things. Again, you know, very important, again, risk factor modification, trying to do things to avoid uh, the risk and the risk factors down the road of getting peripheral vascular disease. Those that smoke, trying to, to significantly cut back or even quit, incorporating some exercise, diet, those kind of things to help kind of uh, and again, those kind of all go hand in hand, but these will all help to, to decrease uh, the, the risk of, of developing peripheral vascular disease in the future. And those patients that already have high cholesterol or diabetes, making sure that those are uh, tightly managed, the diabetes is tightly controlled, cholesterol on appropriate medications and things to, to try to prevent the long-term sequelae of that. And same goes for high blood pressure. So screening for peripheral vascular disease, again, there's not, uh, this is somewhat controversial. You know, there's, we have a lot of screening recommendations for a lot of things, you know, mammograms and, and colonoscopies and things like that. And unfortunately we don't have as strong definitive uh, guidelines or strong, as strong data regarding the screening for peripheral vascular disease. Um, however, I think that, you know, most people would agree that there's probably benefit to screen, you know, high risk patients that have high risk, other risk factors, heart disease, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, older age, those kind of things. Certainly, uh, there have been some guidelines by the American Heart Association uh, put out in 2016 and uh, checking just a simple ABI, even in asymptomatic patients that have other risk factors. Uh, and then when they looked at just patients greater than 65, uh, or all patients greater than 65, those a little bit younger needed, again, some sort of risk factors like some sort of atherosclerosis or high cholesterol, uh, those greater than 50 diabetes or one other risk factor. Again, I think that the, the, the big takeaway for the screening is to just to be, uh, we're mindful for those that have other medical comorbidities that, that certainly place them at a high risk for peripheral vascular disease. So kind of, you know, kind of starting to wrap a little, wrap things up just a bit, but, um, you know, what should you look out for? And these are kind of like, hey, this is the kind of the take home, you know, risk factors, again, older age, much more common as patients get older, 60, 70, 80, other medical uh, conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, smoking, family history, you know, the diabetes and smoking together is probably the highest risk factor, but and, and not to, to say, hey, you know, patients that have all of these, they're, they're automatically going to to get peripheral arterial disease or not. But it's it, certainly we um, we're a little bit more vigilant and monitoring for them. And, and, uh, and these are also patients that would probably even if they're asymptomatic to may benefit from some sort of screening screening. Regarding symptoms, again, the claudication, the, the pain with walking that does get better with rest. 
Um, and, you know, those patients that may have pain at rest, they may get uh, improvement when they hang the feet over the bed or chair. Usually that's a, that's a sign that there may be some, you know, more severe advanced vascular disease. Other signs, uh, you know, painful feet, discoloration, uh, particular redness of the feet, uh, kind of loss of hair or wounds that just really won't heal or someone had it, you know, oftentimes we get patients referred with an ingrown toenail that for some reason that's what started it and it leads to the foot kind of the, the wound not healing. It gets the toe gets infected and then unfortunately they're later diagnosed with, hey, you've got pretty severe vascular disease. So those are things to certainly look out for. I think that's all I've got. So uh, hopefully this is a, a little bit of a an overview and, and uh, highlight some of the uh, things to, to keep an eye out for, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reeve. I will start us off with a few questions. Um, if any participants have questions, please type them in the chat box and I will read them aloud. Um, so your patients that present with peripheral artery disease in your office, what is the most common symptom that you see? Uh, I would tell you probably most people are, <laughs> to be honest with you, are getting you know referred over here from their primary care physician. But I would tell you that um, we get a good many people that get the, the claudication or the, the pain with ambulation. Unfortunately, we do get people that are have, have progressed a little bit more and have already developed a wound that has had some difficulty healing. A lot of times those, um, you know, those seem to be more of the the urgent referrals over, which, um, you know, we, we certainly try to get in when they, when they progress, but I would say more of the, you know, the, the most common thing we probably see is, is the claudication type pain, the patients that just get the pain with ambulation that usually gets better. And, and again, I would, I would stress, we, we share, you know, we, we, we share a lot of patients with the cardiologist. So that, and, it, and as, as you can see from this, there's a, a lot of the exact same risk factors that affect the heart are going to affect the, the blood vessels in the legs. And so, you know, I think that that's, uh, it, it's a good, there's a very good, uh, line of communication and, um, you know, we're able to, to lean on each other to say, Hey, this person needs to be seen for their heart or vice versa. They say, Hey, you know, I think this person they've, I'm seeing them for their heart, but they've also got some vascular disease that I think needs to be addressed. And you mentioned that smoking definitely has an impact and we all know that excess alcohol impacts our heart. Does that also impact peripheral artery disease, excess alcohol? Yeah, that's a good question. I, and <clears throat> I mean, I, I think that uh, it's probably not as strong as a risk factor you know, specifically for the blood vessels, say smoking or diabetes or those things. But, you know, I think the excess alcohol certainly um, is, uh, you know, oftentimes you see it associated with the smoking or the other, other, you know, lifestyle uh, choices. And so sometimes those are uh, kind of all go hand in hand a little bit. And so, yeah, I, I would certainly say that maybe there's not a definitive direct link, but I think the lifestyle uh, choices around excess alcohol are certainly going to factor in for uh, progression and development of peripheral vascular disease. And you also mentioned how peripheral artery disease progresses and the different stages. Is that a rather quick progression or does it happen over time? Yeah, usually, uh, usually it, it's a happens over time and it's I, I, I kind of highlighted a little bit, but it's not quite as a straightforward step line progression. It's like, oh, well, if I get claudication or pain with walking, I'm going to ultimately develop. There's a lot of patients that have claudication. I usually tell people, even patients that have claudication, I say about a third will get better, a third will get worse, and a third will stay the same. So, you know, if you think two thirds are either going to stay the same or even get better, that's pretty good. So it's not as a, a nice, uh, linear step progression in vascular disease. And that's probably, you know, I probably didn't highlight that as well enough, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of patients that claudicate that, that, you know, over time their, their disease is very stable and it never gets any worse. And, and I think that the patients that get the severe form, it is usually, you know, the other risk factors and things, the ongoing smoke and the poorly controlled diabetes and things that, you know, that continues to, 
to, <clears throat> to, to have its effect on the blood vessels and, and really kind of causes the rapid progression. All right, I'll give a couple minutes to see if anyone has any more questions to submit. In the meantime, while we wait, um, this goes back to just what you see in your practice, but do you typically see more men or women? Uh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, I, I think that we probably see, I probably see more men. And I think that is the kind of the, one of the charts there showed is, is certainly as they get older, that prevalence is a little bit higher in men. There's a a little, a small area and a little bit younger where women are actually have a little bit more prevalence than, than men, but as it gets older, but, you know, again, that doesn't say that, that, that one gender is safe or doomed uh, from getting vascular disease. I mean, I think that it is, it does not discriminate and, and those with, with significant risk factors and things, you know, it, it is, it, it's going to, um, to certainly take its toll. And there's some, there's some data about, you know, outcomes in women. And sometimes I, I read something recently about, you know, women with peripheral vascular disease, sometimes some of the outcomes have not been as good, even with treatment. Right. We will wrap things up. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for the presentation. And thank you all for taking time out to join us tonight for this webinar. Um, please keep an eye out for more classes and webinars on Tanner.org. And with that, I will say good night. Thank you all. I very appreciate it.